chapter 12, 5 to 5. 65 minutes to go. How shall I live them? Shall I try to sleep? It would be useless to try. Should I eat a hearty breakfast? I don't want it. Shall I scream and shout? What would be the point? Shall I pray? Why? What for? No. They will do what they will do. Field Marshal Haig is God out here, and Haig has signed. Haig has confirmed the sentence. He has decreed the private peaceful will die. He will be shot for cowardice in the face of the enemy at six o'clock on the morning of the 25th of June 1916. The firing squad will be having their breakfast by now, sipping their tea, hating what they will have to do. No one has told me exactly where it will happen. I don't want it to be in some dark prison yard with grey walls all around. I want it to be where there is sky and clouds and trees and birds. It will be easier if there are birds. And let it be quickly over. Oh, please, let it be quickly over. I wake to the muffled sound of machine gun fire, to the distant shriek of the shells. The earth quivers and trembles about me, but I am strangely relieved, for all this must mean that I am not yet dead. Nor am I all that alarmed at first, when I find out that all I can see is darkness, because I remember at once that I have been wounded. I can still feel the throbbing in my head. It must be night, and I am lying wounded somewhere in no man's land, looking up into the black of the sky. But then I try to move my head a little, and the blackness begins to crumble and fall in on me, filling my mouth, my eyes and my ears. It is not the sky that I am looking at, but earth. I feel the weight of it now, pressing down on my chest. My legs cannot move, nor my arms, only my fingers. How slowly I come to know and understand that I am buried, buried alive, but then how fast I panic. They must have thought I was dead and buried me, but I am not. I scream then, and the earth fills my mouth, and at once it chokes off my breathing. My fingers scrabble, clawing frantically at the earth around me, but I am suffocating, and they cannot help me. I try to think, to calm my raging panic, to try and lie still, to force myself to try to breathe through my nose, but there is no air left to breathe. I think of Molly then, and I commit myself to holding her in my head until the moment that I die. I feel a hand on my leg. One foot is gripped, and then the other. From far away, I think of that I hear a voice, and I know that it is Charlie's voice. He is calling for me to hang on. They are digging for me, pulling at me, dragging me out into blessed daylight, out into blessed air. I gulp the air as if it were water, choking on it, coughing on it, and then at last I can breathe it in. The next thing that I know, I am sitting deep down in what looks like the remains of a concrete dugout, full of exhausted men. All faces that I know. Pete is coming down the steps. He is gasping for breath just like me. Charlie is still pouring the last dribbles from his water bottle onto my face, trying to clean me up. Thought we'd lost you, Tomo, Charlie is saying. The same shell that buried you killed half a dozen of us. You were lucky. Your head's a bit of a mess. You lie still, Tomo. You've lost a lot of blood. I'm shaking now. I'm cold all over and I'm weak as a kitten. Pete is crouching beside us now, his forehead pressed against his wife, his rifle, his rifle. All hell's broken loose out there, he says. We're going down like flies, Charlie. They've got us pinned down, machine guns on three sides. Stick your head out there and you're a dead man. Where are we? I ask. Middle of no man's land, that's where. Some old German dugout, Pete replies. Can't go forward, can't go back. Then we'd best stay put for a while, hadn't we? Charlie says. I look up and see Sergeant Hanley standing over us, rifle in hand and shouting at us. Stay put! Stay put! You listen to me, peaceful. I give the orders round here. When I say we go, we go. Do I make myself clear? Charlie looks him straight in the eye in open defiance and does not look away, just as he used to do with Mr Munnings at school when he was being ticked off. Soon as I give the word, the sergeant goes on, to everyone in the dugout. Oh, no, that wasn't him. The sergeant goes on, to everyone in the dugout now. We make a dash for it. And I mean all of us. No stragglers, no malingerers. That means you, peaceful. Our orders are to press home the attack and then hold our ground only 50 yards or so to the German trenches. We'll get there easy. I wait till the sergeant moves away until he can't hear. Darling, I whisper. I don't think that I can make it. I don't think that I can stand up. It's all right, he says, and his face breaks into a sudden smile. You look all right, Miss Tomo. All blood and mud, with a couple of little white eyes looking out. Don't you worry, we'll stay together no matter what. 
We always have, haven't we? The sergeant waits a minute or two by the opening of the dugout until there is a lull in the firing outside. Right, he says. This is it. We're going out. Make sure you've all got a full magazine and one up the spout. Everyone ready? On your feet, let's go. No one moves. The men are looking at one another and hesitating. What on earth is the matter with you? On your feet! On your feet! Then Charlie speaks up very quietly. I think they're thinking what I'm thinking, Sergeant. You take us down there now, and their machine guns will just mow us down. They've seen us going here, and they'll be waiting for us to come out. They're not stupid. Maybe we should stay here and then go back after dark. No point in going out there and getting ourselves killed for nothing, is the Sergeant? Are you disobeying my order, peaceful? The Sergeant is ranting like a man demented now. No, I'm just letting you know what I think, Charlie replies. What we all think. And I'm telling you, peaceful, that if you don't come with us when we go, it won't just be field punishment again. It'll be court-martialed for you. It'll be the firing squad. Do you hear me, peaceful? Do you hear me? Yes, Sergeant, says Charlie. I hear you. But the thing is, Sergeant, even if I wanted to go, I can't go with you because I'd have to leave Tomo behind, and I can't do that. As you can see, Sergeant, he's been wounded. He can hardly walk, let alone run, and I'm not leaving him. I'll be staying with him. Don't you worry about us, Sergeant. We'll make our way back later, when it gets dark. We'll be all right. You miserable little worm, peaceful. The sergeant is threatening Charlie with his rifle now, the bayonet inches from Charlie's nose and trembling with fury. I should shoot you right where you are and save the firing squad the trouble. For just a moment, it looks as if the sergeant really will do it, but then he remembers himself and he turns away. You lot, on your feet. On my word, I want you men out there. Make no mistake, it's a court-martial for anyone who stays. One by one, the men get unwillingly to their feet, each one preparing himself in his own way, a last drag on a cigarette, a silent prayer, eyes closed. Go, go, go! The sergeant is screaming, and they do go, leaping up the steps of the dugout and dashing out into the open. I hear the German machine guns opening up again. Pete is the last to leave the dugout. He pauses on the step and he looks back down at us. You should come, Charlie, he says. He means it. He really means what he says, I promise you. I know he does, says Charlie. So do I. Good luck, Pete. Keep your head down. Then Pete is gone and we are alone together in the dugout. We don't need to imagine what is going on out there. We can hear it. The screams cut short, the death rattle of machine guns, the staccato of rifle fire picking them off one by one. Then it goes quiet and we wait. I look across at Charlie and I see that there are tears in his eyes. Poor beggars, he says. Poor beggars. And then... I think I've cooked my goose good and proper this time, Tomo. Maybe the sergeant won't come back, I tell him. Let's hope, says Charlie. Let's hope. I must have drifted in and out of consciousness after that. Each time I woke, I saw that another one or two had made it back to the dugout, but still no Sergeant Hanley. Still, I hoped. Then I woke to find myself lying with Charlie's arm around me, my head resting on his shoulder. Tomo? Tomo? He said. You awake? Yes, I said. Listen, Tomo, I've been thinking. If the worst happens... It's not going to happen, I interrupted. Just listen, Tomo, will you? I want you to promise me you'll look after things for me. You understand what I'm saying? You promise? Yes, I said. Then after a long silence, he went on. You still love her, don't you? You still love Mal? My silence was enough. He knew already. Good, said Charlie. And there's something else I want you to look after, too. He lifted his arm away from behind him, took off his watch and strapped it onto my wrist. There you are, Tomo. It's a wonderful watch, this. Never stopped. Not once. Don't lose it. I didn't know what to say. Now you can go back to sleep again, he said. And in my sleep, I dreamt again, my childhood nightmare. Father's finger pointing at me, and I promised myself, even as I dreamt, that when I woke this time, I would at last tell Charlie what I did in that forest all those years ago. I opened my eyes. Sergeant Hanley was sitting across the dugout from us, looking at us darkly from under his helmet. As we waited for any others to come in and for darkness to fall, the sergeant just sat there, not saying another word to Charlie or to anyone, just glaring unwaveringly at Charlie. There was a cold hatred in his eyes. 
By nightfall, there was still no sign of Pete, nor of a dozen others who'd gone out with the sergeant to join that futile charge. The sergeant decided that it was time to go, so in the dark of the night, by twos and threes, the remnants of the company crawled back to our trenches across no man's land, Charlie half dragging me, half lifting me all the way. From my stretcher in the bottom of the trench, I looked up and I saw Charlie being taken away under close arrest. It all happened so fast after that. There was no time for goodbyes. Only when he'd gone did I remember again my dream and the promise that I'd made in it and had not been able to keep. They did not let me see him again for another six weeks, and by then the court-martial was all over. The death sentence had been passed and had then confirmed. That was all I knew, all anyone knew. I knew nothing, whatever, of how it had all happened until yesterday, when at last I was allowed to see him. They were holding him at Walker Camp. The guard outside said he was sorry, but I only had twenty minutes. Orders, he said. It is a stable, and it still smells like it, with a table and two chairs, and a bucket in the corner, and a bed along one wall. Charlie is lying on his back, hands under his head, legs crossed. He sits up as soon as he sees me and smiles broadly. I hoped you'd come, Tomo, he says. I didn't think they'd let you. How's your head? All men did. Good as new, I tell him, trying to respond in, a kind, in kind to his cheeriness. And then we're standing there hugging one another, and I can't help myself. I want no tears, Tomo, he whispers in my ear. This is going to be difficult enough without tears. He holds me at arm's length. Understand? I can do no more than nod. He has had a letter from home, from Molly, which he must read out to me, he says, because it makes him laugh and he needs to laugh. It's mostly about little Tomo. Molly writes that he's already learning to blow raspberries and that every bit as loud and rude as ours when we were young. And he says Big Joe keeps, uh, sorry, and he says Big Joe sings to him for the time. And she says Big Joe sings him to sleep at night. Oranges and lemons, of course. She ends by sending her love and hoping that we're both well. Doesn't she know? I ask. No, Charlie says, and they won't know, not until afterwards. They'll send them a telegram. They didn't let me write home until today. As we sit down at the table, he lowers his voice, and we talk in half whispers now. You'll tell them how it really was, won't you, Tomo? It's all I care about now. I don't want them thinking I was a coward. I don't want that. I want them to know the truth. Didn't you tell the court-martial? I ask him. Of course I did. I tried. I tried my very best. But there's none so deaf as them that don't want to hear. They had their one witness, Sergeant Anley. And he was all that they needed. It wasn't a trial, Tomo. They made up their minds I was guilty before they even sat down. I had three of them, a brigadier and two captains, looking down their noses at me as if I was some sort of dirt. I told them everything, Tomo, just like it happened. I had nothing to be ashamed of, did I? I wasn't going to hide anything. So I told them that, yes, I did disobey the sergeant's order because the order was stupid. It was suicidal. We all knew it was. And that, anyway, I had to stay behind to look after you. They knew a dozen or more got wiped out in the attack, that no one even got as far as the German wire. They knew that I was right, but it made no difference. What about witnesses? I asked him. You should have had witnesses. I could have said. I could have told them. Sorry. I asked for you, Tomo, but they wouldn't accept you because you were my brother. I asked for Pete, but then they told me that Pete was missing. And as for the rest of the company, I was told they'd moved into another sector and were up in the line and not available. So they heard it all from Sergeant Anley and they swallowed everything he told them, like it was gospel truth. I think there's a big push coming and they wanted to make an example of someone, Tomo. And I was the Charlie. He laughed at that. All right, Charlie. Then, of course, there was my record as a troublemaker. A mutinous troublemaker, Anley had called me. Remember eatables? Add up on charge of gross insubordination, field punishment number one. It was all there in my record. So was my foot. Your foot? That time that I was shot in the foot. All foot wounds are suspicious, they said. It could have been self-inflicted. It goes on all the time, they said. I could have done it to myself just to get myself out of the trenches and back to Blighty. But it wasn't like that. I say, of course it wasn't. They believed just what they want me to believe. Didn't you have anyone to speak up for you? I ask him. Like an officer or something? I didn't think I needed one, Charlie tells me. Just tell them the truth, Charlie. Just tell them the truth, Charlie, and you'll be all right. That's what I thought. How wrong could I be? I thought maybe a letter of good character from Wilkie would help. 
I was sure they'd listen to him, him being an officer and one of them. I told them where I thought he was. The last I'd heard, he was up in hospital in Scotland somewhere. They told me they'd written to the hospital, but that he'd died of his wounds six months before. The old court-martial took less than an hour, Tomo. That's all they gave me, an hour, for a man's life. Not a lot, is it? And do you know what the brigadier said, Tomo? He said I was a worthless man. Worthless. I've been called a lot of things in my life, Tomo, but none of them ever upset me, except that one. I didn't show it, mind. I wouldn't have given them the satisfaction. And then he passed sentence. I was expecting it by then. Didn't upset me nearly as much as I thought it would. I hang my head because I cannot stop my eyes filling. Tomo, he says, lifting my chin. Look on the bright side. It's no more than we were facing every day in the trenches. It'll be over very quick. And the boys are looking after me all right here. They don't like it any more than I do. Three hot meals a day. A man can't grumble. It's all over and done with. Or it will be soon anyway. You want some tea, Tomo? They bought me some just before you came. So we sit either side of the table and share a mug of sweet, strong tea and speak of everything Charlie wants to talk about. Home, bread and butter pudding with the raisins in and the crunchy crust on top. Moonlit nights fishing for sea trout on the Colonel's River. Bertha, beer at the Duke, the yellow aeroplane and the humbugs. We won't talk of Big Joe or Mother or Moll, Charlie says, because I'll cry if I do. And I promised myself I wouldn't. He leans forward suddenly, in great earnest, clutching my hand, talking of promises. That promise you made me back in the dugout, Tomo. You won't forget it, will you? You will look after him. I promise. I tell him. And I've never meant anything so much in all my life. You've still got the watch, then? He says, pulling back my sleeve. Keep it ticking for me. And then when the time comes, give it to little Tomo, so he'll have something from me. I'd like that. You'll make him a good father. My father was to us. It is the moment. I have to do it now. It is my last chance. I tell him about how father had died, about how it had happened, what I had done, how I should have told him years ago, but how I never dared to. He smiles. I always knew that, Tommy. So did mother. You talk in your sleep. Always having nightmares. Always keeping me awake about it, you were. All nonsense. Not your fault. It was the tree that killed father, Tommo. Not you. Are you sure? I ask him. I'm sure, he says. Quite sure. We look at one another and know that time is getting short now. I see a flicker of panic in his eyes. He pulls some letters out of his pocket and pushes them across the table. You'll see they get these, Tomo. We grip hands across the table, put our foreheads together and close our eyes. I manage to say what I've been wanting to say. You're not worthless, Charlie. They're the worthless ones. You're the best friend I've ever had. The best person I've ever known. I hear Charlie starting to hum softly. It is oranges and lemons. Slightly out of tune. I hum with him, our hands clasping tighter, our humming stronger now. Then we are singing, singing it loud so that the whole world can hear us. And we are laughing as we sing. And there are tears. But it does not matter because those are not tears of sadness. They are tears instead of celebration. When we finished, Charlie says, it's what I'll be singing in the morning. It won't be God Save the King or All Things Bright and Beautiful. It'll be oranges and lemons for Big Joe, for all of us. The guard comes in and tells us our time is up. We shake hands then, as strangers do. There are no words left to say. I hold our last look and I want to hold it forever. Then I turn away and I leave him. When I got back to camp yesterday afternoon, I expected the sympathy and the long faces and all those averted eyes I'd been used to for days before. Instead, I was greeted by smiles and with the news that Sergeant Hanley was dead. He had been killed, they told me, in a freak accident. Blown up by a grenade out on the ranges, so there was some justice of a sort. But it had come too late for Charlie. I hoped someone at Walker Camp had heard about it and would tell Charlie. It would be small consolation for him, but it would be something. Any jubilation I felt, or any of us felt, turned very soon to grim satisfaction, and then evaporated completely. It seemed as if the entire regiment was subdued. Like me, quite unable to think of anything else but Charlie, of the injustice that he was suffering, and of the inevitability of what must happen to him in the morning. 
we have been billeted this last week or so around an empty farmhouse, less than a mile down the road from where they're keeping Charlie at Walker Camp. We've been waiting to go up into the trenches further down the line on the Somme. We live in the bell tents and the other officers are billeted in the house. The others have been doing their very best to make it as easy as they can for me. I know from their every look how much they feel for me. NCOs and officers too. But kind though they are, I do not want or need their sympathy or their help. I do not even want the distraction of their company. I want simply to be alone. Late in the evening, I take a lamp with me and move out of the tent into this barn or what is left of it. They bring me blankets and food and then leave me to myself. They understand. The padre comes to do what he can. He can do nothing. I send him away. So here I am now, with the night gone so fast and the clock ticking towards six o'clock. When the time comes, I will go outside and I will look up at the sky because I know Charlie will be doing the same as they take him out. We will be seeing the same clouds. We will be feeling the same breeze on our faces. At least that way, we will be together. Chapter 13, one minute to six. I try to close my mind to what is happening this minute to Charlie. I try just to think of Charlie as he was at home, as we all were. But all I can see in my mind are the soldiers leading Charlie out into the field. He is not stumbling. He is not struggling. He is not crying out. He is walking with his head held high, just as he was after Mr Munnings came to him at school that day. Maybe there's a lark rising or a great crow wheeling in the wind above him. The firing squad stands at ease, waiting. Six men. Their rifles loaded and ready, each one wanting only to get it over with. They will be shooting one of their own, and it feels to them like murder. They try not to look at Charlie's face. Charlie is tied to the post. The padre says a prayer, making the sign of the cross on his forehead and moves away. It is cold now, but Charlie does not shiver. The officer, his revolver drawn, is looking at his watch. They try to put a hood over Charlie's head, but he will not have it. He looks up to the sky and sends his last living thoughts back home. Present. Ready. Aim. He closes his eyes and as he waits, he sings softly. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. Under my breath, I sing it with him. I hear the echoing volley. It is done. It is over. With that volley, a part of me has died with him. I turn back to go to the solitude of my hay barn, and I find that I am far from alone in my grieving. All over the camp, I see them standing to attention outside their tents, and the birds are singing. I am not alone that afternoon either, when I go to walkie camp to collect his belongings and to see where they have buried him. He would like the place. He looks out over a water meadow, down to where a brook runs softly under the trees. They tell me he walked out with a smile on his face, as if he were going for an early morning stroll. They tell me that he refused the hood, and that they thought he was singing when he died. Six of us who were in the dugout that day stand vigil over his grave until sundown. Each of us says the same thing when we leave. Bye, Charlie. The next day the regiment is marching up the road towards the Somme. It is late June, and they say there's soon going to be an almighty push, and we're going to be part of it. We'll push them all the way to Berlin. I've heard that before. All I know is that I must survive, for I have promises to keep. Right, well, that's the end. But I would just like to read you the uh, postscript in this book, um, because I think it's really significant to the, uh, the context of the story. In the First World War, between 1914 and 1918, over 290 soldiers of the British and Commonwealth armies were executed by firing squad, some for desertion and cowardice, and two for simply sleeping at their posts. Many of these men were now known to be traumatised by shell shock. The court-martials were brief, and the accused were often unrepresented. It was only in 2006 the authorities recognised the injustice these soldiers suffered. A conditional pardon was granted in November 
2006.